Wow, that was all of you. That was just, this has just been amazing. And we have one more amazing presenter, um, Aaron Sharkey. And it is my real pleasure, true pleasure, to introduce Aaron, who, as I said when I introduced her at her grad reading last fall, um, brought a, a deep collegiality to our program, to every place she, she was in our program, which was many spaces and many places, and a, a quiet authority that I decided was made of equal parts intelligence and passion and the open mind of the true student. And I said she was going to be missed around here as a result, and she is. So I'm very glad that she's back with us for tonight um, to talk about her project. Um, so part of, here's part of what I said in last December when I introduced her at her reading, and then I'm going to try to update that a little bit, but it's difficult to keep up with Erin. She's very busy and productive, so I may not even get it all, but I'll do my best. So Erin, in our program, wrote both poetry and uh, the essay. And her ear for the lyric, the grace note, really, of the surprising word and the associative leap really characterizes her prose, which is her, her thesis manuscript was a manuscript of essays. And, and memoir, I guess we're somewhere in, in that sh shadow land. Uh, it's, to me, a rock solid example of deep writing being a process of discovery. During her time in the program, I watched Erin approach the subject of her biracial heritage and the 20 year gap in her relationship with her biological father with an openness that was sort of bordering, bordering on bewilderment. She came to the subject again and again as if it was all as mysterious as it was the first time that she had, she had uh, essayed, as we say in the essay, to try, that she had made an attempt. Um, and at a certain point, it was very clear to me that she had located the emotional and the intellectual heart of her subject. But the artist in Erin still waited. She tried and she experimented until she found in Marie Cardinal's beautiful phrase, the words to say it. And as a result, her collection of memoir and lyric essays and micro essays and play scripts, I think is poised to make a significant contribution to an evolving cultural conversation. And I hope we're gonna hear about that. Um, so here's the update. She, uh, last summer, was a 2016 Vana Voices Travel Writing Fellow, which meant that she got to extend the writing that she did in her thesis um, that had to do with exploring her ancestry in Mississippi quite late in the project. That arose, again, partly because she just stayed open, open, open. What else is there? What else is there? What else is there? And she sort of hit gold and was able to go and extend that part of the writing um, as a travel writing fellow. She is a 2016-2017 Loft Mentor Series winner in creative nonfiction. And I just have to say, it's so exciting. One of five this year, five Hamlin, either graduates of our MFA, BFA, or one current student um, of the Mentor Series fellows are people, it's great. Uh, she was a 2015 Givens Foundation for African American Literature Emerging Writers Fellow a Given Foundation's cultural producer in residence. She has an amazing podcast. Is that still happening, the podcast? On okay. hiatus, um, As well as a coffee house press in the Stacks Artist in res Residence at the Archie Givens Senior Archive at the University of Minnesota, where she's now helping to promote something called Umbra Search, a digital search tool for African American memoir, memory ancestry materials. Um, and finally, she's going to be reading on October 27th at Common Good Books. So please welcome Erin Sharkey. It's so good to be here. It's great to be back on campus um, and to see folks that I know. So thanks for having me. Um, I also, one of my first events at Hamlin was a co-book talk. Um, oh, the microphone, that's valuable. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, that's, you can hear me? Okay, 
So I'm just glad to be back. I also would like to thank my first um, MFA teacher, Deborah, and my last, Pat. Um, I also would like to thank Laura Flynn, who's not here, but she was awesome. Um, cool, so let's start. <laughs> um, this is an image that um, I found in my research. I'm going to show you some really cool tidbits of things that I discovered. Um, research really was the life of my project, and um, I'd suggest it to anyone who's starting one. Um, this baby in the, um, the tub is my great-great-grandfather, and there's a kitten in the picture. <laughs> cool. So, um, as uh, Pat told you, I uh, did a project um, of lyric essay and um, memoir and attempts and other things um, to understand better um, the formation of my racial identity. Um, and I am a mixed race person. I grew up um, with two awesome white parents, my mom and my stepdad. Um, and I had to embark in the world to figure out what it is to be a black woman um, with their support, but on my own. Um, and I also wanted to figure out what this what this relationship is with my dad, who was gone from when I was about four years old, almost five, until I was 25, um, 26 years old. And um, to do that, I wrote about three different journeys, three different trips as sort of the cornerstones of the project. Um, my last visit to Milwaukee as um, a four-year-old, my last court-ordered visitation with my father. Um, and then I wrote about the trip where we reunited and I met um, my siblings and like I have seven brothers <laughs> and a sister uh, and tons of aunts and uncles and a huge gang of people who were very excited to meet me. Um, and then the last part of it was this trip to Mississippi that I took with um, Curtis and my little sister who is seven years old. Her name's Olivia. Um, I spent time uh, in, this, in this project redefining words that I held as commonplace or obvious, <laughs> with obvious definitions. They um, expanded, they telescoped for, telescoped for me, they um, flipped around uh, words that I thought I knew really, <laughs> I thought I knew them. They did not mean the same things anymore. Um, it's, about, it's about coming of age, it's about um, the importance of place and movement, um, and really in the process it was about healing for me. And I did do a lot of that. Um, so I'm going to talk just in these sort of categories um, and give you some cool just stuff as, apart from my story that were cool that I found. Um, so the spark for my project um, uh, had to do with this fo these photographs. Um, my mom kept a huge box of pictures um, of my dad's family. Um, and they, I didn't look at them as a kid, I didn't really want to, but they were an important gift to me and definitely like a, um, a token to bring with me to, to reconnect with that family. Um, I was fascinated, my mom's in this picture, um, I'm going to walk, my mom's right here in this picture, um, and I wanted to know so many things <laughs> about her. Um, and so I started to chronicle some questions. Um, and this, this, it had to do with the energy of this picture, her isolation in the image, um, what is she looking at, <laughs> what, why are all these people together, all these people I am blood related to and I don't know them, and what is the loss in not knowing them. Um, I also, uh, this project I set out with some goals in mind. Um, I wanted to push the boundaries of the genre as much as possible. I wanted to find the edge of it. I wanted to step on it, <laughs> step over it. I wanted to figure out how poetry and CNF work together. Um, I am trying to articulate something that doesn't have words for it, so it was good to have the tools of poetry, so I wanted to walk the line. I also um, had to use imagination um, as a survival tool as a kid to figure out how to fill the space of this big man in my life. Um, and so I wanted to insist on imagination as a tool of truth, as a, as a true thing, and to see its place in my work. Um, so in preparation for this work, I did write about this subject in almost every class I could possibly write about it in. Um, and I think that that was 
a good thing to do. Um, I definitely found material that I could revise in a way that I, to give integrity to it. Uh, it was certainly the subject matter I knew when I started what I wanted to write about. Um, I also um, set a plan that ha was scalable. So I thought, I could write 10 essays that are pretty good, <laughs> and maybe that'll be good. Um, and, but I knew that if, what I really wanted to do was to, to string them together, to figure out a way to have a full arc in a project. Um, so that was important. I did um, lots of independent studies, and I would suggest it to anyone who possibly can do them. I did three of them while I was a student here. Um, it allowed me to design a course and to work with faculty that I couldn't work with otherwise, um, to spend my time, to build my practice of writing. Um, I also did all of the Waterstone workshops, and those were super important to get ready to do thesis. Um, so I think it's important to think about support structures and to um, think of thesis process as a bridge out of the program. So not just a project to end your time here, but to really to get you to the life of writing and to the world. Um, and so I um, worked with two other writers in this program, um, Sarah and Andy, who were, were called the trio of doom. <laughs> you could form a threesome. <laughs> you can form a group of three people, but you can't use our name. But I would suggest it. Um, we met regularly during the process of writing. We rooted each other on. We gave each other ideas. We read each other's work. Um, we complained together. Uh, I would recommend it. I also found an amazing community in Gibbons, and I would recommend finding people um, and to think about what is not here in the program and find that community in the world. Um, I also uh, took an opportunity to work with um, Alexis Dubo as my outside reader, who I'd worked with before, but it was an op awesome opportunity to really think about what kind of um, what kind of reader I wanted, what kind of feedback I wanted, um, and she did that work for me. <laughs> um, cool. So uh, I really geeked out about research because I love it. <laughs> it's very important to me to being stimulated. So I, I'm, I was reading constantly, but also like looking for information and the ways that things um, started to create energy together. Um, so I did, uh, I started with this Coffee House Press and the Stacks residency, which is an incredible opportunity. Uh, and they really, I got a little bit of money and just like four months to do whatever I wanted <laughs> in the collection. Um, and so I did do that. Uh, I started with um, looking at uh, narratives by former slaves um, during the Federal, Writer, the Federal Writers Project. Um, they uh, sent folks into rural Mississippi, very near where my ancestors are from, to take narratives. Um, and there are 12 of them that have never been published that live in a box. They look like this um, in the stacks at the University of Minnesota. And I started there and got to explore as far as I wanted. Um, but I really think that there was something awesome to ground myself in the experience of to, to translate this experience into the experience of my ancestors. Um, I also um, investigated my obsessions. I, um, I named them, <laughs> uh, I would recommend doing that, and I interviewed people in my life about my obsessions. Um, and they cracked open a lot of things for me. Um, I'm obsessed with missing persons, and I think initially, I, like every kid in Minnesota, I thought that was about Jacob Butterling. Um, but in the process of writing this <laughs> project, um, I learned very um, significant things about my life and, and this sort of cloudy memory that I didn't, uh, I didn't have clear, but I have it clear because there are resources in your life that can help you know those things. Um, I, I thought of myself as a writer in my life, and so even if I wasn't at the page every day, I was writing every day. So I was writing by creating ideas, by making meaning of my life. Um, by uh, being intentional. So um, I also, um, yeah, I, I looked at the material that I came in. So I had a draft of lots of material before I started. Um, I thought about it as 
in the tiniest details and as a global project in the micro and macro senses. Um, I researched my family. I don't know if I can't really see it. Um, so I uh, found an ancestor in my research. Um, he was born in 1825. It's, it's this, here not I know. How do I get it brighter? No, it's not interesting. I think it's just clearer. <laughs> I don't know. He's coming clearer. <laughs> um, his name is Elijah, Elijah Sharkey, um, and he was born in 1825, um, and he had, um, we can find record of um, over 40 children, there's rumor that he had 60 children, 60 children, um, and they ranged in age about 63 years, um, youngest to oldest. He, um, was also mixed race, which is exciting for me to find out, um, he owned 100 acres of land in Rome, Mississippi. He um, had a white servant that lived in their house before the Civil War. He voted years before the 15th Amendment. It's a pretty rad person um, and exciting to also think about um, land. And so it was pre in preparation to go to Mississippi. So I did do that. Um, I went um, with my father to Mississippi. Um, I visited. Um, the segregated cemetery where my family members are still buried. Um, it is a location that dates back to a slave owner named Josiah Brooks who um, owned many members of my family, I enslaved many members of my family, um, and my cousins, my cousin was buried there last summer. Um, so they still are buried on the black side of the cemetery. Um, and this answered a question that I had growing up. My mom went to visit Mississippi before I was born. She thinks I was conceived in this place. Um, and sh they visited there because my father's um, uncle had passed away. And so she told a, a kind of incredible story about the men going to dig the grave. Um, and so I, it was one of the places I needed to go to. Um, and I think it's valuable to make a list of the places that you need to go to to time travel, to experience the way that time folds on itself. Um, so I went there with my little sister, who does not have any significant, there's no significance to it, um, to her really, and so it's good to sort of experience the different levels of consciousness in the space. Um, to, to follow my father around as he encountered landmarks that triggered memories for him, opportunities for him to tell me things he wouldn't have told me if when we sit down with each other. <laughs> he's kind of, he's not a talkative person. Um, so also ancestors, of, those are my great grandparents. Um, I also visited Sharkey Bayou, which is on the land that um, Elijah Sharkey owned, and it is um, a kind of puddle. It's not, it's not cool or anything, <laughs> um, but it does indicate some sort of power in memory and retrie retrieving that sort of information. Um, Sharky Bayou is connected um, to the Tallahatchie, Ri Tallahatchie River. Um, if you go to the site where Emmett Till's body was discovered, you have to turn on Sharky Road and pass the sign for the river site, um, which is riddled with bullets because of reasons I'm sure you can guess. Um, so I also uh, just got to think about my father as a historical figure too, as a person who um, lived in time and understanding his relationship with his own parentage, with his, the land that he grew up in, the reason that he left that land, um, helped me to understand the way that he, the choices he made in his abilities to parent me, and inability to parent me. Um, I also, in pushing the boundaries of craft, um, felt like there came a place where it was too, I was, it was too, the voice was too um, claustrophobic and I, I, I really wanted some breath to it and I wanted to um, honor the, the idea of imagination in the draft. So um, I, I took the weirdest, I've never written screenplay before, but I decided that a screenplay could help me to do what I wanted to do in the draft. Um, I wanted to acknowledge the fact that when I spend time with my father, that um, it's not just the two of us there, that I bring with me um, a woman that is me of my imagination, is the girl of my imagination, the girl of my dreams, the girl that didn't have to navigate the sort of questions I had to navigate, who is more proficient at blackness, who is <laughs> um, angrier and able to express her anger in a way that I can't. Um, I also know that sometimes when he's talking to me, he's talking to 
someone he imagined me to be in my life. Um, she's lily white. She doesn't understand blackness at all. Um, she is innocent to an insane, a same, insane degree. I know as well that he, I'm talking to him and I'm talking to someone who is not him, who is the man that, I, that left me, that was able to, who was incarcerated, who was scary, who did drugs. <laughs> I also know that he wants me to think of him in a certain way, so he brings with him to our interactions the sort of perfect dad, the sort of reformed, perfect dad. Um, and so I wanted the six of us to have a conversation. So we do. <laughs> and um, I argue that it works really well in a nonfiction draft, a nonfiction piece. Um, so yeah, and then uh, post, post Capstone, I got to hang out by palm trees in Miami um, and got to think about the ways that the travel pieces work in the draft. Um, I got, those got pulled apart and exploded and built back together and I'm excited about what, what they're doing. Um, it was really, really helpful for me to bring the work that I was doing around racial identity to a group of people who share the challenge of writing about racial identity. Um, so Vona was awesome and uh, it was a great, great experience. Um, yeah, and then The Loft has also been really fun. I'm just starting, but I'm excited to work with Laura Flynn again um, and to work with my national mentor, um, Allison Hedgecoke. Um, and then I have a reading. Um, I have three readings that week. There's one on campus, you should come back to that one, um, with uh, Andrew Jenkins and Sung Young Shin and Carolyn Holbrook. Um, I have, I'm working, uh, during my thesis presentation, I um, experimented with film. Um, I found old footage um, of my childhood and incorporated that into my reading, and I was asked to turn that into a dramatic piece for the late night series, so I'll be doing that in November. Um, and I have a reading at the St. Paul Almanac at um, Black Dog Cafe that same week in October. You should come to that one. <laughs> it features a lot of Gibbons alum. And yeah, so I, I think I'll just close by re reiterating the idea that this process can be really healing. I encourage you to be selfish, to do work that engages your heart, <laughs> engages the sort of traumas of your past to sort of think about those primordial wounds and, and to address them. To also think about it as a bridge to where you want to go when you're done here because you can get to the end of this program and feel like you fell off a cliff. But you shouldn't <laughs> because this community is really rich and great and there's awesome opportunities here. So thanks very much. Uh, I have two questions. Yeah. The first one is, can you talk a little bit more about what those archives were at the U and, and what you did there? And also, how on earth you could focus on one thing when you got in there and saw that stuff? <laughs> <laughs> That's my first question. And then my second question is, have you ever written, you were talking about how all six of you sort of get, get along when you're, I mean, all six of your sort of personas get along when you're getting together with your father. Have you ever written anything with those six personas being separate and actually talking to each other? Yeah, they do that in the draft. Oh, in the draft. That's yeah, what I thought. So, <laughs> yeah, I allow, I, I, I find comfort, my, my voice is finding comfort in community with these other women who are not me but are me. Um, I get to say things I want to say to other characters. We sit in fields, we, we do yeah. lots of stuff. Um, <laughs> So the archive is overwhelming. <laughs> um, the archive that is uh, physical at the university um, has thousands and thousands of pieces of um, material significant to African American literature. Um, it has ephemera and correspondence. There are hundreds of letters between June Jordan and E. Ethelbert Miller. There are um, first editions of Phyllis Wheatley's novel and Frederick Douglass, there's two of them. <laughs> um, you can hold them. <laughs> um, I uh, was overwhelmed, but I um, just let one thing lead to the next thing. So in the narratives, um, the first narrative, they talked about food. The second narrative, they talked about food. The third narrative, they're talking about gardens and food. And so what I, you know, it may be sort of a, um, 
a break from my thesis project, but it, it, sort, it really ha it felt like I can't, I can't really like divorce them from each other. But um, I really started to posit that the garden um, was a place on the plantation that the slaves experienced um, autonomy. And so I looked for food references and autonomy sort of references in regards to food in lots of other places in, in the collection. Um, Umbra, which is the program I work with now, um, is a digital archive. It, um, it aggregates uh, material from hundreds of institutions, maybe 600 institutions of black memory, like the Schomburg and the Amistad collection. Um, it's all the digital material that they have available, and it come, goes into one place, so you can search you can search vegetables, which is what I searched a lot. And then you get hundreds of things. So I found this really cool letter from the University of Massachusetts Amherst that makes reference to a terrapin stew. Um, it's a letter from E. E. B. Du Bois talking about making, he asked his wife to make terrapin stew for a gathering of the early NAACP, the, Nash, um, the Niagara movement. And all of, like, the, there's a lot of terrapin turtles in the area of the people that were in the narratives, and they were proud of their terrapin suit there, too, so I'm trying to make links. Anyway, <laughs> there's so much that isn't in the draft, but will be there in the, the narrative. Anyway, any other questions? Yes. <laughs> How do you navigate intense emotional journey and make our elephant at the same time? Yeah. <laughs> um, I like my voice is like shaky, but I cry like six or seven times a day, sort of. <laughs> so you know me like this is not like a big deal. <laughs> um, so and I I feel like I'm pretty in touch with sort of emotionality of my life, um, and I find joy in the fact that I feel things about my life. I think that that's pretty rad. Um, so I think that it helped me, it's certainly helped me in healing, it helped me to, to understand what I thought about my life, to make meaning of it, to, um, to sort of, yeah, to put it, to, to put it in relationship, to time travel across the experiences of my life, to sort of start to, um, to, to feel the victory it is that I am who I am and that I love still. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Thank you for that.